you know, my, my talk is titled Exiting the Comfort Zone and that's exactly what I did when I stepped out of my house to come here and talk to you because talking is really not my comfort zone. I'm more comfortable behind the camera or behind the computer. But Sachna Kapoor is a very old friend and it was impossible to keep postponing and saying, no, oh, maybe I'm out of town. So finally I had to say yes to her and I'm glad I did. Thank you all for coming. And I hope it's as enjoyable and as inspirational as what we hope. <laughs> anyway, this slide is from Mar Salaam Bombay shoot. Um, this is three people who are not in their comfort zone. Two are trying to shove salt down their mouths. And the third is our Boomer Neil. It was his first time in India and uh, his first time seeing anything like this. So that's uh, my title slide. Um, uh, so the first time I actually exited my comfort zone was in 1975. Uh, I was the kind of kid who always was most comfortable at home. I'm an only child who up with an extended family. And the few times I ventured out of my house, once I remember distinctly going to a cousin's for a night spend and staying up all night listening to all the unfamiliar sounds and waking up my aunt and having her take me home in the middle of the night. But the other time I remember going to a picnic at Juhu Beach with a friend's family and missing home so much that they, the Pope family had to drive me all the way back. <laughs> so that was the kind of child I was and I don't know what possessed me uh, when I was 17 years old to apply to go to college in America. And I never really thought about it very much. It was just in the spur of the moment that, you know, madness that I did it. And I happened to get very, very lucky, it was almost a miracle, that I got admission and I got scholarship, uh, got a full scholarship to Harvard University. Now that's not something you can reject, and not that I did want to reject it, but I remember lying on my bed at home, looking at my familiar wall and thinking, what the hell have I done? <laughs> How am I going to do this? And my teacher who's here with me now, Mrs. Rati Wadia, wrote, uh, wrote me a wonderful thing about the agony and the ecstasy which, where she talked about the agony of leaving and the ecstasy of what was to come ahead and that was exactly what happened. So I went to Harvard University and uh, that's where my uh, adventures with the camera began. I went with a small Instamatic that was gifted to me by my aunt and uncle in Hong, in Hong Kong and uh, soon started taking pictures of the fall leaves and the snow and all the wonderful stuff that I was seeing for the first time. But very soon found the need to upgrade to a better camera. Uh, though I was on scholarship, I, I had very limited means because I was working several jobs to, for my own personal expenses and I certainly didn't have the money to buy you know, a good camera myself. My roommate very sweetly uh, lent me the money, $200, and I had a friend who worked in the music library, his name was Steve Giovannis, and he was a stringer for the Boston Globe since he was 16 years old. And he told me, you buy, I'll help you choose a camera, then I'll help you, uh, I'll, I'll teach you how to use it and how to bring it. And that's how I got my first camera, Nikomat, which was the Nikon's lower end cameras and uh, with the proper lens, first real cameras, so went around taking pictures. And then homesickness and my new camera combined to make me take a leave of absence for one semester where I came back to India with my camera to take pictures. I roamed around everywhere and the only good picture that resulted from that trip was this picture. Um, taken from the Taj Mahal Hotel, the Sea Lounge. Uh, this was in 1977. And this was in the days when, of course, the Taj left their windows open. It was the days before terrorism. Um, after that, I, uh, I had the good fortune to spend a summer in France. And these are the pictures I took in France. Um, uh, this was in the French Pyrenees, in these mountain villages. 
and every village had a fete every Saturday where people would go to. The cemeteries had photographs of the deceased person, which I found quite fascinating. This is a tenant farmer working on the fields of a mansion. So I came back to college and I showed these to my photography teacher and she gave me a show, my first show ever, outside the dark room. Or it was called the Carpenter Center and I, of course I printed my own photographs and I cut my own mounts and that was my first show. And I was thinking back while I was putting these photographs together that for a teacher really, you know, they see so many students, it's, you know, it's your one of hundreds, thousands. But for a student, something like this is something so memorable that you never forget it. And I never forget the encouragement and the fact of, you know, displaying these pictures and it, it was like a very huge moment for me. Um, so then I graduated, I'm taking you through my journey and, you know, it's, it's an unplanned journey to show you that sometimes journeys without plans can have good results, <laughs> sometimes, if you're lucky. I graduated um, from Harvard and went to NYU to uh, study film. I was actually at Columbia, but Columbia didn't have a dark room, so I uh, shifted out to NYU. And I, I had the luxury of studying something that I really enjoyed doing with no career goals after that. So I enjoyed watching films, but I had no desire to be a film critic or to write reviews. And uh, it wasn't a very practical course of study, anyway I did it. And then at the end of it, I was kind of baffled, now what am I going to do? And came back to India and almost as a default position, started working as a professional still photographer. Uh, did a lot of travel stories, did for Signature and Namaskar and a lot of stories for newspapers. In those days, papers did full page photo features. I did one on Basera um, uh, in Mysore for the Indian Express, things like that. But being a photographer in those days, and that's the early 80s, was really, really difficult because it was very expensive. Uh, the, the materials were expensive. People didn't pay that much. When they paid, you had to chase them for your payment. So it was under in those circumstances that I met uh, Raghuveer Singh, who turned out to be uh, my mentor and changed my life in a way and showed him these pictures along with the ones you saw in France. These were taken in <coughs> Newark, New Jersey, where I used to live. And these that I had taken of my family in Bombay and in Pudwara in Gujarat. And he looked at my pictures and zeroed in on the Parsi pictures and said, why don't you do a book on Parsis? Um, that book is now available in Kitab Khana. It's the second edition. I did a first edition in 2000. Um, it was a very extremely uh, long journey in the book. He said, start shooting in color, which is when I started shooting Parsis in color. Uh, but then I had another life-altering experience, uh, which was that Mira and I and I, who had college together at Harvard, we joined hands and we made, we worked towards making Salam Bombay. Salam Bombay took me into the world of films and um, photography took a backseat, the book took a backseat and I plunged headlong into writing my first screenplay for Salam Bombay. <coughs> this is Irfan. We did a workshop for the street kids. Um, this is Barry John, the eminent theatre personality and teacher. Mira, Anita Kanwar, Dinal Stafford, and 
the, this was on any given day, the crowds watching us shoot. <laughs> there, uh, we are at Grant Road Station and we are shooting in a building on the second floor and they are all looking up at us. Uh, I also took photographs on set. Uh, this is their far, you know, see. This is uh, the, the, the kid on the right is the one who was the real Chai Pao and on the left is Shafi who played him. This was a photo I took of uh, Shafi fooling around on set and became one of the posters for the film. Uh, so Salam Bombay was uh, actually uh, a lesson in exiting your comfort zone because I had never written a screenplay before in my life. Mira had never directed a feature film, the kids had never acted in a film before and that film had all the positive good energy you have when you do something for the first time without knowing any better. When you just plunge in without thinking about it too much and just do it. Uh, we were lucky, the film was enormously successful and um, I found that I had a career as a screenwriter. Uh, my second film, also for Meera, was Mississippi Masala. Again, something that was completely out of both our fields of knowledge, which was writing about the material <coughs> film about the African American community in the deep south of America. Uh, as was the case with Salam Bombay and Mississippi Masala, when you venture out of some your familiar familiar territory. Uh, the way to do it, in my opinion, is to do a lot of research, which is what we did. This, uh, on Mississippi Masala, I wasn't on set all the time. Uh, I was just there for rehearsals and first day of principal photography. When, if you're an American screenwriter, which I was, then you get most of your money on the first day of principal photography. So I took all my money, which was a lot, <laughs> And I went to New York and I bought myself cameras that I could never afford before. And I not only bought one, I bought two of the same. <laughs> so I bought two Leica M6s and a whole battery of lenses with the money I made from Mississippi Masala. This is Roshan, uh, Mohan Gokhale and Mohan Agashe. Uh, sadly and very tragically, Mohan Gokhale passed away. This, this, these were all in Greenwood, Mississippi. In 94, I got married. <laughs> uh, one can say that was also getting out of my comfort zone because I was 30, uh, how old was I? I was 37 when I got married. That's quite old. My husband was, we both were very kind of set in our ways. It was a big step to take for both of us, happily, with very, very happy results. So anyway, in 94 when I got married, um, that's for those Bhattiwala, um, he urged me to start with my photographing, with my Parsi's book again. He said, look, it's all, uh, all your photos are just gathering fungus. What are you doing? And so I started again. But the way I did it, first I looked at a lot of publishers and then I decided to publish it myself, which was another huge step. Publishing your own book is in a way harder than making a film. I had two people in the company I had started, Good Books, which is my fourth requirement for uh, Zoroastrianism has good words, good thoughts, good deeds, and my fourth requirement is Good Books. That's what my company is called. And there are two people, there were two people in the company, Aurobind Patel, who designed the book, me, and my father, who took care of everything else. So, in the old days, you needed publishing companies to publish a book because you needed their design departments, you needed a lot of things. But when I thought of my book, <coughs> luckily postponing it had made it viable for me to do it myself and, and I found in my, in my own life that sometimes postponing things have actually worked out well for me. So because I postponed this whole process, uh, Desktop publishing had 
you know, or was, was there, and one could actually produce a book from your own desk at home, which is what we did, uh, or even designed it, thanks to Zareen Kama, who was then the CEO of HSBC Bank. I pre-sold half my print run, and I, uh, I went to Hong Kong to print it because I found out that it was much cheaper because when you import books from Hong Kong, or anywhere else, you're not paying customs duty thanks to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru who made this, uh, made this wonderful, wonderful law that when you import books, there's no duty on them. And so I printed it in Hong Kong, it worked out cheaper. When you print here, you have to pay a duty on, uh, on, on paper. The only question was where to store them. And <laughs> <laughs> this is where it was taught, in the Parsi Langham Hospital. My dad used to work opposite the hospital and had very friendly relations with everyone there. There were very few people there actually. There was the Parsiana office and the trustees of the hospital. And uh, they, uh, I rented a room from them and my dad very sweetly rat proofed the room and everything. And the other person who had distributed the books was Hussein Paniwala, who had a water business, still does, in the compound of the Parsi Lion Hospital. So he has a lot of trucks and he helped my dad clear the room and we loaded all the books onto his trucks and started delivering them from place to place. But when I saw the mountain of books that I had imported for the first time, my heart just sank because it's one thing to Theoretically, it's say 5,000 books, and it's another thing to actually see them in the flesh. Anyway, Hussein was a great help, and this is a compound of Parsi Langan Hospital, and we distributed them, and that was my first edition that came out in 2000. Um, I was, you know, of all the things, the book is. I'm very proud of having made the book. It's been a wonderfully popular book. I, I had a lot of hesitations. I thought, you know, people would get, somebody or the other amongst the Parsi would get offended, but nobody did. It was it really very popular. And, uh, but what I was proudest of was being a publisher because I, I grew up with a grandfather and a grand uncle who were completely obsessed with books. And I have inherited their book book library uh, and they were good friends of Tara Povala and Sons which was a, who was a book publisher and they would have been absolutely thrilled that their granddaughter published or well, became a publisher and published her own book so that was a huge thrill for me. So my publishing company has done two versions of Parsis, the first which had a yellow cover, the second in 2004 which is still in print and available here at Kitab Khana. And then along with my friend Mary Marfatya, uh, we published this book called Parsi Bowl, which is a very funny, very popular book on uh, Parsi phrases. And it went out of print really quickly and we're planning a second edition soon. So then it brings me finally in a very roundabout way to Little Zizu, the film that I made when I was 50 years old. I was uh, I was on the set of the namesake, a, a script I wrote based on the book by Jupa Perry for Mira in Calcutta. This is Nimai Kosh, the uh, Satyajit Ray's photographer in the red shirt. Dayanita Singh, Irfan again, young Irfan and Tabu and old Irfan. So this is a picture of my daughter Yana and um, one of the assistant directors on the namesake, Nitya Mehra. Now, my kids, we were visiting the set, I wasn't there all the time, so I was visiting with my kids and my mom, and we asked ask the kids if they'd like to be in the film. My son said no. <laughs> he went back to the hotel with his nanny and sat in air-conditioned comfort and had kathi rolls. My daughter Iana said yes, she wants to be in it. 
and she had makeup and the sari and this poor kid sat for hours and hours waiting for her shot and when you see her in the film you blink and you miss her so anyway after I don't know if she's here she's supposed to be coming after after namesake I was back in Bombay and I had no current scripts on hand and I started writing what then became Little Zizu. I wrote it for my kids. I wrote it for a lot of actors who I had in mind while writing it and took full advantage of <laughs> what Iana could do on screen. And so she played the role of Iana. And uh, uh, lots of scenes I wrote with them in mind, you know, hearing stuff that they said. This is her uh, speaking to a parent in Inspector Puzo's voice, something I've heard her do. And this is Jahar, my son, uh, who is a good footballer. And I shot it in, my, in the lane where I grew up, where I took several of my photos that are in the book. So it was very much a family and friends affair. This is him standing on his head, something he used to do often. This is again the Parsi line in hospital. <laughs> uh, my books were stored downstairs and we had our production office upstairs and we used it for many scenes in the film as well. Uh, this is Tino Francorsi who is half Parsi, half Italian. I met him at a party. And I was very fascinated by him and when I asked him and I found out his origins, I wrote him into the script without knowing whether he could act or not. Thankfully he could. This is my parents' house, a scene in my parents' house. And this is my neighbor, Mr. Danny Spencer, who uh, who's, used to be a commando in his young, young days. Uh, the film was written very much as a reaction to what was going on in the world at large with fundamentalism. And unfortunately, unfortunately those issues are still very much alive and relevant today. Uh, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, address those issues with humor, not with seriousness. And so I, it was like everything I've done, Little Zizu was partly based on fact, fictionalized fact. Uh, there was, when I was writing it, a, a, a fight between a newspaper editor with very liberal views and a so-called leader of the Parsi community with extremely regressive and uh, almost fundamentalist views. And I used that struggle between the two of them to weave a story that was more than the struggle. It was about other things as well, but that was the central inspiration and core of it. This is uh, Cyrus the Second Kodaiji and his sidekick, Miss Patel. And I wrote this role for Baman of the newspaper editor and I was so lazy I didn't even bother changing his name. So <laughs> he is Baman Preswala in the film. And he's the newspaper editor who doesn't give a damn and who takes on the, the fundamentalist. Uh, this is our friend Rustam Hathi Khanawala, who is actually a Supreme Court lawyer, the person in the I Love New York t-shirt. <laughs> Kurush Debu, who was in such a long journey that I had written. Ms. Patel. Imad Shah, who I, I wrote this role for him. Imad had a, had a curious history with me and Little Z, so I wrote the role for him. Then his mom said he could miss college to act in films and I started looking around at other people. Then he had a very bad train accident and was home for a really long time and I ran into his mom Ratna and she said, you know, if you're still interested, Imad could now play the role. And so I was delighted and he's really a comeback kid because the accident was pretty severe and the damage to his one leg was very severe, which is why he limps in the film. But I wrote that limp in, in one scene to kind of explain it. Uh, this is a, we shot uh, on a boat called, uh, I called it the Susie Wong in the film. And uh, it was kind of poetic revenge for me for writing the scene 
that took a really long time to shoot. The boat was so rocky, I got really seasick. <laughs> As did a lot of other people. So we were shooting upstairs and there were people in the crew puking from <laughs> uh, This is my dad and his gang um, uh, who, who are Baman's friends. Uh, this is also taken from reality. My dad went to Xavier's college and he used to be a scout and then what is called a rover, which is after a scout you become a rover. And for me this, the rover symbolized what is best about Bombay because there are Parsis, Christians, Jewish, um, anyone and everyone is a rover and they are so tight, they are such a tight group and they still meet uh, on the first Monday of every month. And I adore them, and so that got written into the film. Uh, we shot in Udwana, where I've been many times, and that's in my book. Uh, Mahabharata plays the mad grandmother, very sporting, I might have. Kamal Sidhu. Uh, this is a scene where we, uh, it was meant to be funny as well as sad that in traffic, a traffic choked Mumbai. What, what happens when an ambulance is stuck? And we actually created this traffic jam. And for those, my husband was stuck in the traffic jam for real. And when I went home that night and told him that he had actually <laughs> created it, he thought it was a terrible thing to do. But you know, we had to do it for the scene and we shot it with hidden cameras. And uh, the cop, uh, there's a cop also who, in the film, he's waving Baman along because he thinks it's for real. And people thought it was for real, but right at the end, someone recognized Baman. <laughs> <laughs> this was another very fun scene to shoot. Uh, this is uh, Imad Shah's imaginings. And again, uh, written very much uh, with Iana, my daughter's real personality in the film. She says, I don't want to get married. I want to live with lots of dogs. <laughs> that is actually what she had once said, and that Shama, and those are our dogs, puppies. Our dog, who's in the film, gave birth while we were shooting to eight puppies, and four of them were in the film. This is the scene that got us a UA certificate, because um, He's, he's uh, Zuxis, the kid, is watching, uh, is playing his football game, but on both sides of him, in the cyber cafe, they're surfing porn. And because of this one little scene, we got a UA certificate. Unbelievable. Uh, Zenobia Shroff was a real fine. Uh, she's an actress from New York, and very lucky to have found her. Uh, Iana trained to do a tap dance at the end, but then Shabak came in and she did, he did a completely different dance with her and she was very amazingly stepped up to it and did it really well. Uh, this is our New York premiere where you were at. Salman Rushdie came to it. <laughs> the kids were interviewed. <laughs> they had a very good time. This is after the dinner, celebration dinner. And this was our DVD launch. And we got to travel. We went to uh, we went to Granada and where we saw Mr. Omar Sharif, which was a huge thrill. And the Alhambra of course. And I call this all the president's women because we were all women who made the film and we got the national award from our Woman president. Uh, that was, sorry, that was Avantika, our producer. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, Dinar Stafford, producer, and that's me. And then there are ones that got away. This is a script that never got made. It's called Travels of My Elephant. Uh, I worked on it for many, many years. Um, but it was one instance where it was fun, even though it didn't get made. This was the producer and uh, Aditya Patankar and Mark Shan. Now Mark Shan and Aditya, Mark Shan is Kamila Parker Bowles' younger brother who tragically passed away about a year and a half ago, very frequently in New York. And he, on a whim, decided to travel with Tara 
800 miles across India with Aditya. Um, and um, he wrote a book on his experiences called Travels on My Elephant, which I was gonna, uh, which I was gonna adapt. And we went to Kanha to see Tara where she is. And it was the greatest thing because we could swim with her and bathe her and the kids had a ball. Because my husband loves elephants. So that was one instance where even though it didn't work out, it was well worth doing. And then most recently I had a show at Javeri Contemporary where I did something where I've that I've never done before. I showed photographs, uh, mounted in light boxes. And these are new photos in the sense I've never really shot photos without people in them. But uh, this is a part of my new series. This color is very bad on this projector and on the screen, so the colors look nothing like this. But uh, And the, the series is all about patterns and colors and lines rather than people. This was the gallery, so you can see how small they are. Uh, they're the ones on the left. And this is how they were at the gallery. And now, 10 years nearly after making Little Zizu, I'm hoping to make my second film. It's called Three and a Half. And I'll open it up to questions. What's Three and a Half about? <laughs> <laughs> that was a trick. <laughs> It's about Bombay now and Bombay in the future. And it's huge because it's... Uh, let me shut this up. Uh, it's huge because it has a lot of effects because of the future. Uh, and it's a love triangle between one woman and two men who are both in the present and in the future as well. Can we open that question? Yeah, please. Can I ask the first one? Of course. So you talk of, you've done, you've sort of gone in so many different directions and you say it was not your comfort zone, but how do you do that? How do you get yourself on a completely different journey from the one you just come from? Um, I guess not thinking too hard. <laughs> and I, I think if you are not too worried about being judged, then you can do it. But if you're always going to worry about being judged, that means therefore you're worried about failing. Then you can't. I think that's the key. And some of these projects stayed with you a long, long time. Yeah, a long, long time, yeah. As I said, postponing them. You know, I had a, a solo show, a, 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 quite a big show at Kemul Art Gallery in 2013. And because I postponed showing the work for so long, when I finally did show it, it had that much more, you know, kind of weight to it because it then spanned so such a long time and postponing it made it historical and a lot of other things. Yeah, they didn't help me write it, but I stole lines that I heard them say for sure and seen them do. I definitely, I stole from a lot of places and I stole from their lives and also I, I, I am, when I write scripts, a great, you know, like a magpie collecting bits and pieces from everywhere. Definitely a lot of stuff that they were like in reality worked itself into the script. And also they improvised a lot. And I welcomed improvisation on the set because I I just welcomed it. So there's a scene where um, uh, my son has been berated by uh, Cyrus the Second Kodaiji and Ms. Patel for drinking straight from the bottle at the fridge. So he shut the fridge and he picked his nose and he stuck the snout of the handle and it's completely his doing. Nothing that I've been written in the script is brilliant, it gets a laugh every time. And then I said, where did you think about it? And you said, what do you think I do at home? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question. Yeah. Uh, 
Ja. 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 Sorry? Ja. The best The best The best case. Face. I can't really say, but because I think Little Zizu was such a personal project and I had a fantastic cast and a fantastic crew. My kids were in it. It was really a family and friends film. You know, our makeup room was in our, my neighbor's house. I think I'll never forget that experience. That was really, uh, really a once in a lifetime experience that will stay with me. Or you can say I'm a Jill of all trades. <laughs> How did the Sebastian fundamentalists respond to it? <laughs> yeah. I let my teacher answer that. <laughs> she had a direct experience of it. <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, suddenly Sunny has put this on me, but uh, it's, uh, we've had great laughs over this. Um, I have taken the poster. Um, and my husband pasted both sides and I took it to the fire temple which is next to our Shapurbad colony to put it up and the Agyari said we cannot do it here, you do it on the wall outside but we cannot do it inside. So I tried to put one on the wall and then I went to our uh, shop, uh, Sukhar, Sukh, uh, sandalwood shop that's always there outside the Agyari and I asked him, I said please will you do this? because a student of mine has done this and it would be, it's a movie on our community. So happily he put it up. God knows how. I don't know if I can name the person, but the fundamentalist. He <laughs> heard about it and he saw it and he is shouting at that fellow. He says, Hari, what are you doing? You know that this uh, film is all uh, against uh, Parsi priests and all, you don't uh, uh, dare uh, show this and all. And this fellow said, I don't know, someone gave me and I put it up and he didn't remove it. So I was very happy and I had a long conversation with Sunni over this and he never used to come to our fire temple but suddenly I saw him a couple of times in our fire temple. And uh, uh, it's very, um, it's very f uh, funny that, uh, especially that um, when the movie got so many awards, and uh, they usually they usually give um, trophies to Parsis who do all kinds of things, but this is one <laughs> we never thought of giving any award. <laughs> He also became a Parsi Pachar trustee. <laughs> you know, I made a private limited company solely because to protect myself in case uh, in case I got sued. Nothing of the kind happened and now I'm stuck with this private limited company <laughs> that I can't really get rid of very easily. Did your movie intervene in the process of Yes, I think it did. I think people enjoyed it. I think people laughed. And that was my goal. It was to make fun of this person. It wasn't to, you know, treat him with respect by treating him seriously. I wanted to show him up for the complete fraud that he was. How to work? Expand. Expand the comfort zone. But my talk is about how not to expand your comfort zone. <laughs> how to get out of your comfort zone. <laughs> so that is when you get out of your comfort zone is when you will start doing different things. Yeah. Hi. 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 Hi.
Mississippi was Salah's original source, Salah's book, the namesake was this very famous book by Jumpa Lehrer. I've adapted another book, Such a Long Journey, by a writer mystery. But both namesake and Mississippi was Salah has this feeling of the tribe for Patol trying to fit in. Which one? This is a big. Had that sense in both of these movies, and then trying to make sense out of it. You know, does it have some kind of connection? Pardon me for saying so. Being a Parsi in India, is there something like? No, it has a connection that Meera and I were both immigrants to America. And when we went in the 70s, it would, there were not that many as there are now. And so uh, immigrant stories we naturally gravitated towards. And uh, Mississippi Masala for sure, that was 1990. Uh, namesake was later, I had moved back here. But the namesake spoke to us in many ways, both Meera and I had to both our experiences, both the young generation as well as the experiences of the older generation who we chose to make the focal point as opposed to the whole. You know, uh, so with this P Masala and namesake, there's, I think there's a resonance in that for so many communities across the world. But what was the reaction to Little Jizu outside? Outside, uh, you know, people, it was received really well, but I think people didn't know where to kind of place it because it again falls outside the common categories of the art film that you're used to seeing from India or Bollywood. It's not Bollywood. It's not really an art film. And people, I don't think, are used to seeing comedies from India. <laughs> you know, and about a community that they've never heard of. <laughs> so it was received well. But I think also it baffled a few people. <laughs> yes, so uh, for being a photographer, you screen writer, was there a time when you were like scared, like get jitters, you're like that feeling is there from doing one thing and then moving on towards being something else? Yeah, it's always it's always terrifying. Uh, it was really terrifying before the first day of shoot, for instance, for Little Zizu, where I felt like I, you know, I was just about to give my ISC exams. Those were the big exams when I was in school, level standard. Felt like that. Um, and my stomach was in complete knots. But I think once I got onto the set and the day started rolling, you know, you just start going with the flow. Same with Salam Bombay. Um, I had not studied screenwriting, but everything I had done fed into screenwriting, in my, in my opinion, helped me uh, because I was a literature student, so uh, studying literature helped me with point of view, character, nar you know, narration. Uh, photography helped me to think visually. Cinema studies, you know, made me watch a lot of films. I think all those three things fed into my first script. But yes, it, it's always you know, neither Meera nor I were street children. So that responsibility of, 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 of just being correct and accurate. Uh, with Mississippi Masala, it was the responsibility of, of conveying an African-American reality. Uh, so those are realities that are completely outside our, our familiar, you know, worlds. And as I said, the way to get over that fear and to get over that hurdle of not doing it is just to plunge yourself into that world and find out as much as you can about it before, before starting.